Well, good morning. It is so very good to be at Creation Fest again. And uh, this is my uh, fourth year at Creation Fest, but it's my first year without my wife here. And I'm, I ran into Simon um, on the weekend before the start of Creation Fest, and, and we were both kind of like the Lonely Hearts Club band together. And, uh, th but I was quite jealous of him because his wife was going to show up on Sunday and my wife wasn't going to show up at all. Um, she's um, back in the, in the States. She's on her way to Brooklyn, New York to visit our oldest daughter and our two grandchildren. And uh, so I'm so stoked for her, um, but a little s missing her this morning. Um, I want to start by asking a question that, that I have not asked in the last three years that I've had the privilege of speaking in the Big Shed. Um, how many of you are brand new to the Bible, like you're, you're new friends with the Bible and you're just kind of getting to know each other? Raise your hand if you're kind of brand new to the Bible. Anybody? Okay. How many people here um, have known the Lord for more than a year? Raise your hand if you've known the Lord for more than a year. Wow, lots of you. How many have known the Lord for less than five years? Raise your hand if you've known the Lord for less than five years. Wow, so most of you, you guys are kind of, there's a few of you. How many of you have known the Lord for more than 10 years? Raise your hand if you know the Lord. Wow, a lot of you. That is so great. Guys, I'm just excited to study the Bible with you this morning. And it's simply amazing that the longer we know Him, the more we love Him. And what I'd like us to do this morning is I've been asked to... That my, my, um, my portion of Hebrews is chapters 9 and 10. And um, there is absolutely no way that I can cover the entirety of two chapters of the book of Hebrews in 40 minutes. I'm going to barely cover half of chapter 9. But I think it's the salient stuff for us this morning on this day in this, this version of Creation Fest. So let's all stand. Um, this morning, and I'm going to read from the first 15 verses um, of Hebrews chapter 9. I'm going to be reading from the English Standard Version. It says, now, even the first covenant had regulations for worship and an earthly place of holiness, for a tent was prepared. The first section, in which were the lampstand and the table and the bread of the presence, it is called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a second section called the Most Holy Place, having the golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden urn holding the manna and Aaron's staff that budded and the tablets of the covenant. Above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. These preparations having thus been made, the priests go regularly into the first section performing their ritual duties, but into the second only the high priest goes, and he but once a year, and not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the unintentional sins of the people. By this the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy place is not yet opened as long as the first section is still standing, which is symbolic for the present age. According to this arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper, but deal only with food and drink and various washings and regulations for the body imposed until the time of reformation. But when Christ appeared, as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the sprinkling of defiled persons with the blood of goats and bulls and with the ashes of a heifer sanctifies for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Therefore, for this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant, 
so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. Lord, we're just standing in awe of you this morning. I pray that you would go before us in all of this, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, whether you're relatively new to the Bible or whether you've been walking with the Lord for five years or ten years or twenty years or more, I'm, I'm pretty sure that there, that there were those listening to that passage that we just looked at and that were thinking, what in the world was all of that? I've been walking with the Lord now for almost 45 years now, and, and there are still times when I read the book of Hebrews, and I think exactly that sometimes. I don't know if, maybe I'm just speaking for me, but man, I find that there are times when I'm reading the book of Hebrews, and I'm thinking, what in the world was that? Especially as you get deeper into the book of Hebrews. I pray that by the grace of God and by the help of the Holy Spirit, that Jesus promised, which I'm so glad he promises the help of the Holy Spirit in the study of His Word. Uh, by the help of the Holy Spirit, we're going to figure it out this morning and in the process be forever changed by who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for us. So I, I, I want to stop and just pray one more time. Would you bow your heads and your hearts um, before the Lord and, and just pray a, again. Lord, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You for every portion of it. Every word God breathed every word here for a purpose and we know that this passage is in your book because there's something that you want us to understand about yourself in this passage there's something that is so radically important for us to understand about our broken lives and this broken world so heavenly father i ask in the name of jesus that you would open each of our hearts to the work of the Holy Spirit as we study your word this morning. And Holy Spirit, we pray that you would open your word to our hearts. We're so thankful for that very precious promise that tells us that the unfolding of your word brings light and gives understanding to the simple. And I pray that you this morning would overlook all of my inadequacies as a man and as a teacher so that this passage would have a loud, a clear, a heavenly voice to each and every one of us this morning as we study it together. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. Well, here in the opening of Hebrews chapter 9, the author returns to subjects that, that he's already very beautifully and very biblically addressed earlier in this letter, chapter 4, chapter 8, and, and praise the Lord, Simon was just, the Lord used him to just open that chapter to us in such a beautiful way. And, and in those chapters, he was referencing things, and now he, he is again referencing them, not merely for the sake of repeating himself, he does it to set the backdrop for a subject that is so radically important to each and every one of us. So I'd like us to begin this morning with a, with a really big observation. There are two words in Hebrews chapter 9 and chapter 10 that are repeated because those two words are so crucial to understanding our relationship with God. The first word is the word blood, and the second is the word conscience. So let's start with the first word blood. The sacrificial system of the Old Testament, all of which pointed to and anticipated the sacrificial death of Jesus on the cross, it, it was all an incredibly gory bit of business. If we were to count just the scheduled public sacrifices that the priests would offer on behalf of the people. And by that I mean not the sacrifices where individuals would come and they would bring their sin offerings or they would bring their animals to be sacrificed as, as individuals living in the nation, but just the scheduled public sacrifices that the priests would offer on behalf of all of the people from Moses to Jesus for about a thousand plus years, there would have been close to two million animal sacrifices. I was looking at what R. Kent Hughes had to say on these chapters in the book of Hebrews, and he said that, that each bull that was sacrificed would spill somewhere between, and I had to do the conversions, 3.7 to 7.4 liters of blood. 
and each goat would spill about a liter of blood. Now, not knowing the exact ratio of bulls to goats in those scheduled sacrifices, I, I roughed out some numbers, and it came to about 11,356,235 liters of blood in just the scheduled offerings that the priests would offer on behalf of the people. Now, picture this. A swimming pool that's nine and three quarters meters long and almost five meters wide and one and a half meters deep, that swimming pool contains 71,820 liters of water. It would take 158 of those swimming pools to hold the amount of blood shed over those 1,000 plus years. If you were to put those 158 pools end to end, you would have a swimming pool that was just under five meters wide, one and a half meters deep, that would extend for just a hair under a mile. Imagine a mile long swimming pool, a meter and a half deep, 4.8 meters wide, filled with blood. Guys, the Old Testament pretty much floated on a sea of blood. 21st century Western culture recoils at the thought of all of that blood and all of that death. And, and I'm going to steal the title of the song, I Can Only Imagine. I can only imagine the outrage if the RSPCA and PETA and Greenpeace were around in that day how they would decry all of it as absolutely, utterly barbaric and inhumane. But here's what most people fail to ask when confronted by all of that blood and all of that death. They fail to ask, why? Why so much blood? Why so much death? And they fail to see that all of that blood, all of that death, Tell us that sin is real. That's so important in a world that wants to say that sin's not real at all. All of that blood, all of that death tells us that sin is real and that sin is serious. And that sin, now get this, sin brings death and sin demands death. They fail to see that all of that blood and all of that death tells us how wrong things are. And how seriously wrong we are, you and I are. Because the world is broken, and we, that would be you, that would be me, every one of us have been complicit in its brokenness. We, you, me, we are guilty. And our brokenness and our guilt is so deep that we cannot fix it with education. Our guilt and our brokenness is so deep that we can't fix it with therapy. Our guilt and our brokenness is so deep that we can't fix it with any number of social programs that we could ever come up with. The remedy and the rescue would require something infinitely more radical than any of our efforts. And that's why the Holy Spirit, without hesitation and without apology, inspired the author of Hebrews to use the word blood 12 times in the 28 verses of Hebrews chapter, chapter 9 and three more times in Hebrews chapter 10. Every day, for over a thousand years, every ounce of those millions of liters of blood tell us the truth about sin. Sin brings death, and sin demands death. Now, that leads us to the second important word, conscience. That word conscience is used once in verse 9. In, in Hebrews chapter 9, and again in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14, and then a third time in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22. Guys, the Holy Spirit is very concerned about this thing called conscience. And if the Holy Spirit is really concerned about this thing called conscience, we should be too, and so we should be asking, well, what is this thing that we call conscience? Here's how one guy defined conscience. I think it's going to be up on the screen for you. He defined conscience as, conscience as the intuitive, God-given knowledge of right and wrong. 
conscience is the intuitive, God-given knowledge of right and wrong. Because you might want to write this reference in the, in the margin of your Bible there in Hebrews chapter 9. Romans chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. There the Holy Spirit informs us that every single person born into this world has this thing called conscience. And because we have this intuitive, God-given knowledge of right and wrong, we know that we're always supposed to do what we know to be right, and we should never do what we know to be wrong. And all around the world, men and women know that lying is wrong, that stealing is wrong, that murder is wrong. And all around the world, men and women know that refraining from lying, refraining from stealing, refraining from murder is right. But here's the deal. And it is 100% true about 100% of human beings, except for Jesus. No one lives up to the standard of our conscience. And we all, all of us, fall short of the standard of our conscience. It's called a guilty conscience. And whether we feel that for five seconds or five minutes or five hours or for 50 years, all of us experience it because we all live a life below the standard of our conscience. And guys, that should tell us that our conscience does not originate with you and me because our conscience is so much higher than us. This thing called conscience comes from from someone greater than ourselves. It comes from God who created us. And this is so incredibly important, guys. In our fallen world, our sense of guilt is the last reassurance is that there is someone who transcends us. Our conscience is so incredibly important because all day, every day, our conscience reminds us of this great gulf that exists between the life we were made for and the way we actually choose to live. All day, every day, our conscience testifies to us that number one, we were originally created for something higher, and number two, we've fallen from it. That we are living below the line of what it means to be truly human. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but our conscience, it's like a massive PA system blasting at us. Our conscience is like a Times Square, New York City size video display blazing at us, telling us that we are fallen. We're fallen. We, you, me, we're fallen. Which is exactly what the Bible teaches. And I want to take a moment to encourage you about the Bible. There are a lot of people who either discount the Bible or stay away from the Bible because they think that it's a hopelessly complex book that's impossible to understand. I mean, it, after all, it, it contains so many genres of writing. It's got historical books and poetic books and prophetic books. It's got the Old Testament. It's got the New Testament. As far as most people are concerned, even a lot of people who go to church, there's just no rhyme nor reason to it. But the fact of the matter is, is that the Bible is in a very real way a simple book. It's a record of three things. It's a record of the creation of man, Genesis 1 and 2. It's a record of the fall of man from the loftiness of what man was made for. We find that in the beginning of, of Genesis chapter 3. And then from the last half of Genesis chapter 3 forward, the rest of the Bible is the record of God at work in human history to redeem and restore man back to the position he had before he fell. That's the storyline of the Bible. Creation, fall, redemption. Now back to this thing called conscience. We all know something about a guilty conscience because the Bible says, and I like Eugene Peterson's paraphrase of Romans chapter 3, verse 10, in the message, he paraphrases it as, there's nobody living right, not even one. And then a few verses later in Romans chapter 3, verse 19, we're told that the whole world is shut up, silenced, and stands guilty before God. We need to understand this about sin. When I commit a sin, when you commit a sin, we're not just committing a sin against other people. 
we're always and supremely committing a sin against God. And that creates a huge problem between us and God. Simon just alluded to it in, the, in his session. When we finally come to that place in life when we realize that we're fallen, and, and, I, and, and guys, you, when I say that we realize that we're fallen, it doesn't mean, oh, I have this, like, this really solid theological, biblical understanding of what it means to be fallen. No, when we finally come to realize that we're falling, fallen is it's realizing that for everything that we know and everything that we have that we have this profound sense that we're lost i love this lyric it's from a very very old christian song it says and we didn't find the way or the answers to the questions that were buried deep down in our souls we just found that the ways of men have no answers anyhow it's knowing way deep inside that nothing in this world can deliver the life, the sense of meaning and purpose that can fill that massive void in our hearts. And, and it's getting to that point where you're just sick and tired of living life on your own terms, which, by the way, is a simple definition of sin. Sin is just saying, I'm going to live life on my terms, not God's. And though you might not personally say it in this way, what you really want is to know God. What you really want is to walk with God. What you really want is to be in relationship with God. Again, as Simon so beautifully laid out for us and explained from Hebrews chapter 8. What you really want is the relationship that you've been created for. But we are immediately confronted with the guilt of our past sin. Our conscience tells us, and David Robertson, man, he said this so well on Sunday afternoon. Our conscience tells us that we're not worthy of that relationship with God. Our conscience tells us that we are not fit for the presence of God. Our conscience tells us that we're not fit for divine examination. We're not fit for divine scrutiny. Our conscience tells us that in light of who and what we have been in our past and what we've done in our past, that He is too holy. He is too perfect. He's too great for us to have a relationship with Him. Our conscience tells us that instead of drawing near to Him, we should actually run from Him. We should actually hide from Him. And by the way, isn't that the response of our first parents when the first sin was committed in the Garden of Eden? Where do we go? What do we do? How, how can we ever meet Him? Well, in Hebrews chapter 9, verses 9 and 10, the writer tells us, first of all, what we should never do. He tells us specifically that we should never run to the law of Moses. And he tells us we shouldn't run to the law of Moses because the sacrificial system of the old covenant offered no ultimate solution to our guilt. And I think that as we look at those verses, chapter 9, verses 9 and 10, we also see in a general way that there is no religious activity. There's no amount of religious effort that can ever provide the ultimate solution to our guilt. And here's how the Holy Spirit sets all that up for us. In those first five verses of Hebrews chapter 9, the Holy Spirit, he just wants to introduce to our minds, and again, he's writing to first century Christians who they were immersed in Hebrew culture and in the Levitical system. They were immersed in it. So he's introducing, and then for those in the first century, he's refreshing their minds with the picture of the Old Testament tabernacle and what would later become the temple on the Temple Mount with the compartments and the furnishings within it. And I loved how he says, and of these things, we just don't have time to talk about. It's like he just wanted to take a rabbit trail and just talk about the beauty of how they each just spoke of and pointed to and are fulfilled in Jesus. But he goes, we don't have time for that right now. But then in verses 6 through 10, he gives us details concerning the priest's access within the tabernacle. He tells us that the regular priests, not the high priest, but the regular priests, they ministered daily in that first room that they would walk into within the tabernacle, that room called the holy place. Then he tells us in verse 7 about the second room, the most holy, the holy of holies, and how that room could only be entered on one day of the year, on the day of atonement. And only the high priest could enter into that room on that day, 
And that was only after he had offered a sacrifice for his own sins and the sins of the people. Guys, it took all of that for just one man to enter into the model of heaven for just a few moments in the entire year. And to top it off, verse 10 in chapter 9 tells us that all of that could not make even the holiest man in the holiest place on the holiest day of all perfect in regard to conscience. Couldn't deal with his conscience. Much less anyone else, much less just the regular folks in the nation of Israel who had been, have been gathered outside of the tabernacle, later gathered outside of the temple, waiting for the high priest to come out of the holiest place on the holiest day. Instead of making men and women perfect in regards to conscience, the writer tells us this in chapter 10, verse 3. He says, but in these sacrifices, there's a reminder of sins every year. Guys, the fact that those sacrifices had to be offered again and again and again and again was proof that all of that blood, all of that death did not and could not provide a sinner with the perfect and complete confidence of the personal forgiveness of sins, with the perfect and complete confidence of being accepted by God, which our conscience needs in order to enjoy the freedom to approach God and to worship God and to live for God without reservation. The author tells us why those sacrifices could never cleanse our conscience. Look at chapter 9, verse 9. He tells us that those things were only symbolic. They were only symbolic. They pointed to, they were a picture of, they anticipated a greater high priest who would offer a greater sacrifice that would allow us to follow him, not, not merely into the model of heaven, this earthly tabernacle, but into heaven itself. All of those sacrifices were given to prepare man for the sacrifice of the only begotten Son of God. In chapter 10, verse 5, the writer tells us that those millions and millions of liters of the blood of bulls and goats could not, could not take away sin. Guys, until the voluntary sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, and I, and I really want to stress the word voluntary, it's so very important. You know, none of those animals, those millions of animals that were sacrificed between Moses and the cross of Jesus, none of those animals were lining up saying, oh, me next. Slit my throat. Let me bleed to death. They were involuntary. But not Jesus. Jesus volunteered. The creator of everything. The Lord, Yahweh, the preexistent, eternal God, creator of heaven and earth, came as the Lamb of God to be slaughtered, to shed his blood for the remission of sin. Until the voluntary sacrifice of Jesus upon the cross, the sinner always had this awareness that he had not yet or she had not yet come into contact with the sacrifice that was powerful enough, that was mighty enough, that was majestic enough, great enough, personal enough to overwhelm and to cleanse us of the personal guilt that we feel in our conscience due to sin. Jesus doesn't merely cover our sin. He provides us with a complete forgiveness of our sins. And on Tuesday morning, both Tim and David spoke to that with such great clarity. Jesus doesn't just make us outwardly clean or ceremonially clean. He cleanses our conscience from guilt. And he gives us great boldness and joy and confidence in a personal relationship with God. The blood of Jesus provides forgiveness that reaches all the way into this deep inner thing called a conscience and produces peace there, which is where we so desperately need it because the greatest damage that is done in our lives due to sin, and, and I don't want to minimize this, man. There, sin is so damaging. The collateral damage of sin is so horrific. The damage that we can do to our own bodies because of our sin is so horrific. But the greatest damage that's done in our lives due to sin, it's not external, but it's internal. It's what it does to our conscience. The unrest that it brings to our conscience, the guilt that it brings to our conscience, even the torment 
that it brings to our conscience. But when we put our faith in Jesus for salvation, we not only receive the complete forgiveness of sin, the Holy Spirit comes into our lives and He brings to us a supernatural, God-given peace to our consciences concerning our past sins. How is that possible? How is the Holy Spirit able to do that? Look at verse 14 of Hebrews chapter 9. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Guys, did you know that the Holy Spirit is passionate about revealing Jesus to us? It's His passion. Try to think of it like this. Have you ever had anybody ask you the question, what makes you want to get out of bed in the morning? And you might think, man, I'm passionate about this. I'm passionate about my marriage. I'm passionate about my kids. Passionate about my job. Well, let me tell you something. The Holy Spirit, man, the thing that gets him out of bed, and I say that only figuratively, is he is passionate to show us Jesus. It's the Holy Spirit who reveals to us, who shows us, who shines into our hearts the reality of the sacrifice of Jesus. And as he shows us Jesus nailed to the cross, like that song we've sung this week, we are undone by heaven's love revealed before our eyes. When, when he suddenly opens our eyes and we see Jesus crucified, as we see Jesus nailed to that cross, we know way deep, deep down inside of us that no sin, no lifetime of sin is greater than that sacrifice. And we know that to be true because God the Holy Spirit indwelling us bears witness to that. And that knowledge brings peace to our guilty conscience. God incarnate, nailed to the cross, silences a guilty conscience, satisfies a guilty conscience, allows a guilty conscience to rest because, and guys get this, Deep down inside, we know that we should not get off free for what we've done. And that's why any attempt by this world, any attempt by people around us to minimize our sin, to tell us there's no such thing as sin, or even give us a litany of religious works and good deeds to do to try and make us feel less guilty, none of those things can ever, ever bring peace to a guilty conscience. Only justice for my sin can do that. Only the knowledge that I am right with God because His justice has been satisfied can bring peace to a guilty conscience. And only the death of Jesus in our place for our sins provides that to us. Here's the deal. When we see Jesus hanging on the cross for our sins, we realize that no one got away with anything concerning sin. This is so huge, guys. Jesus hung on that cross in order to provide the full and satisfying payment for our sins. His last words from the cross, at least in our English Bibles, reads, it is finished. In the original language, it was just one word. His last word. To tell us die. We would say it is finished. We would say paid in full, but... But I love that song, and I get wrecked every time I hear the lyric. It says, and as you speak, a hundred billion failures disappear. And all I, every time I hear that, I go right to Jesus, nailed to the cross, saying, to tell us die. As he spoke that word, a hundred billion failures blotted out. Guys, when the Holy Spirit shows us Jesus hanging on that cross, no one can say, my sin is greater than that sacrifice. There is something about that cross, that sacrifice, that Savior, that scene that overwhelms even the guiltiest of consciences and gives hope for forgiveness and peace. Guys, Christianity is not merely nodding in agreement with a list of doctrinal beliefs. Like, check the box if you believe, right? That's not Christianity. It involves doctrinal agreement, 
believing certain truths to be true, but it is experiencing the reality of the Holy Spirit bearing witness to the fact that something great, something majestic, something indescribable, something of infinite worth has happened in human history that's even greater than all of my sin. The gospel, the good news concerning Jesus is so amazing. It's not religious advice. The gospel announces to the world that God did something in order to cleanse us, to free us from a guilty conscience. God had to provide us with a something that we recognize as being infinitely greater than all of our sins. And that something is the salvation that is found in the blood of Jesus Christ. So that now, whenever I'm reminded of the guilt of my past sin, it's completely overwhelmed by something that is infinitely greater. And in my mind's eye, I just have the visual of a tsunami rushing and just it just overwhelms everything in its path. That something is the knowledge of God's love for me demonstrated by the death of Jesus on that cross and the completeness of the forgiveness of my sins that's provided in the shed blood of Jesus. I love in the book of Revelation, he loves us and washed us from our sins with his blood. I need you to hear me here, guys. A cleansed conscience is one that is fully aware of what we have been, but is now even more, infinitely more aware of and dominated by the forgiveness that is found in Jesus. We're not ignorant of what we have been, but we're even infinitely more aware of and dominated by the forgiveness that's found in Jesus. I'm going I'm to repeat it. A cleansed conscience is one that is fully aware of what we have been, but is now even more, infinitely more aware of and dominated by the forgiveness that is found in Jesus Christ. And that awareness, again, it's not merely a theological awareness, like, okay, here's this theological stuff over here. No, it's theology that's experienced. It's experiential theology re resulting in doxology. Our theology must be so real, so personal, that it results in praise to God. Here's what that awareness produces in us. E every reminder of our past sin is turned into a celebration of God's love. God's grace, God's forgiveness. When I'm reminded of my past sin, I'm, I'm literally able to say to God, Lord, in light of the price that Jesus paid on the cross for the forgiveness of my sins, I refuse to rummage around in the mess of my past. Instead, I'm going to choose to give you praise and thanks and honor and glory right now for the completeness of the forgiveness you've provided for me in Jesus. Every time the world or the flesh or the devil tries to remind us of our past, we can turn it into a worship service, praising God for the infinite power of the shed blood of Jesus to cleanse us. You know, condemnation is one of the devil's most powerful and proven weapons against the believer. But when we use the reminder of our past sins as the catalyst to praise God for the greatness and the might and the majesty of our Savior the greatness and the might and the majesty of the blood that was shed for us on the cross, that weapon of condemnation is rendered useless. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul did concerning his self-righteous, arrogant, hateful, violent past. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. He was aware of what he was. But then Paul uses that radical, powerful, wonderful little, in our language, three-letter three letter English conjunction, the word but. There in 1 Timothy 1, 16, but I receive mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. And as Paul thinks about it, he doesn't allow his mind to stand on the greatness of his past sin. That would have ruined even the great apostle Paul. Instead, he declares this in 1 Timothy 1.17. To the king of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. It's only the sacrifice of Jesus that allowed Paul to do that with his guilty conscience. It's only the sacrifice of Jesus that makes this possible in each of our lives as well. And cannot, 
cannot we say this morning, praise the Lord for that? Would you just say, praise the Lord for that? Here's how I want to wrap this up. Every day and everywhere, people are trying to deal with this thing called conscience. Maybe it might be one of you this morning. Maybe it's a dear friend. Maybe it's a loved one, a co-worker, somebody that you know from school or from university, someone that works at the coffee shop that you go to or that you visit with in the grocery store. Every day and everywhere, people are trying to deal with this thing called conscience, trying to eliminate the very real sense of guilt. But they never stop, stop to ask why their conscience is tormenting them. And when, when they try to silence their conscience, they're fighting against and trying to silence the very thing that actually assures them that they have significance. Because their guilt, your guilt, my guilt, points to the reality that we're not here by accident. That there's a transcendent creator who's made us in his image and that our sense of meaning, our sense of purpose is wrapped up in knowing him. And that should come to no surprise that on the individual level and on the global level, there's a campaign to silence the voice of our conscience by denying the existence of God, writing God out of your story individually, writing God out of the story of humanity. Because if there's no transcendent God who's the ultimate moral authority who will judge our actions and attitudes, then there's no such thing as guilt. You construct your own definition of right and wrong. You define yourself. You direct yourself. But guys, know this. If you want to get rid of guilt by getting rid of God, there's a price to pay, a horrible price. When you write God out of your story, you lose all meaning in life. You lose all significance because if there's no author, if there's no creator, then nothing matters. Life has no meaning. Here's what an honest, honest atheist said. Bertrand Russell. Here's some snippets of, of, a, of a passage from him. Man is the product of causes which had no prevision of the end they were achieving. His origin, his growth, his hopes and fears, his loves and his beliefs are but the outcome of accidental collocations of atoms. All the labors of the ages, all the devotion, all the inspiration, all the noonday brightness of human genius are destined to extinction in the vast death of the solar system and that the whole temple of man's achievement must inevitably be buried beneath the debris of a universe in ruins. Wow, have a nice lunch. Now, there are others when it comes to dealing with their guilt. They're less concerned with such existential considerations. They just want relief from their guilty conscience. And they'll deal with it by making excuses, deflecting, trying to justify. It was their circumstances. It was somebody else. It was this. It was that. Others, others try to escape their guilty conscience by the use of substances, drugs, alcohol. And we should stop and wonder how much addiction had its origins in a person's attempt to deal with guilt. Other people try to deal with guilt by filling their lives with every possible distraction. Man, that is life in 21st century rusting culture, right? That, that's, uh, that's social media. Social media is like the real opiate of the masses in the 21st century. People just can never allow themselves to get quiet because as long as there's no silence, they don't have to think about guilt. And then some people try to deal with guilt by religious activity. Again, Hebrews 9 and 10, I think, shout to us about the inability of religion to silence a guilty conscience. The author calls religion dead works. And modern church culture would love to give the impression of not being religious because it can be so hip and it can leverage technology and the venues don't look so religious anymore. But for all of that, for a lot of people, going to church is just a religious activity by which they hope to take care of their guilty conscience. And it cannot. Remember, the countless sacrifices, that ocean of blood shed under the Old Covenant could never perfect the conscience, and, and, and the, the author uses the word, the conscience of the worshiper. But there is a way, a singular way to cleanse a guilty conscience, and that way is a person who said, I am the way. That way, that singular way has a name, and his name is Jesus. And what a beautiful name it is. What a powerful name it is. The one who silenced the boast of sin and grave.
Jesus is God's way to having a conscience that is so clear of guilt that we no longer have to hide from God, that we're confident that we're fit to be in the presence of God and to have a relationship with God. Hebrews 9, 14, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience? Hebrews 10, 22, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him for... Here's why we can do that. Our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean. That is God's way. I'm going to ask the worship team to come out. We're going to close here. There will be some discussion questions for you, but as the the worship team comes out, the Connect team is going to come forward here to the front. And it's my prayer that this morning all of our hearts have been undone by heaven's love revealed before our eyes in the shed blood of Jesus. That's so powerful, so majestic, of such infinite worth that it can provide forgiveness that reaches all the way into this deep inner thing called a conscience and produce peace there. And if you've exhausted yourself trying to escape your guilty conscience by writing God out of your story, blame shifting, substance abuse, every kind of distraction, good works, religious works, I want to tell you, you can approach God today by looking to Jesus Christ and saying this, Jesus, I believe your assessment of me. I'm guilty. And I so believe that you willingly shed your blood for my sins to wash away all of my guilt and all of my shame that I give my life to you, trusting in your shed blood to make me right. 